My next speaker is Robert Hanson, our snake. Many of you have read his blogs and have learned quite a bit about security like I have from this gentleman. So let's give him a warm welcome and thanks for leaving the confines of Texas to come to the beach. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Test, test, is that okay? Can you, ooh, is that all right? Can you hear me? Excellent. So yeah, my name is Robert Hansen. Uh, I'm a director of product management at White Hat Security. Uh, it's really great to see all of you. There's so many familiar faces from years ago. Um, uh, a lot of new faces too. It's really, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, when I started in this space, there was just a handful of people in the world doing it. Um, and now, I mean, this room easily dwarfs anything that we had in the entire world. Just this room. So it's it's pretty amazing. Um, so um, I used to run hackers.org for those who don't know me. I've written a couple of books. Um, this presentation really isn't about me or my company. Uh, but um, I wanted to, you know, as a keynote, I get a sort of an interesting take on the world. I get to do something a little different than I normally would do. Uh, typically, I do some super technical talk. Uh, uh, one I did at HUSEC on, for instance, uh, was you know, taking down China, for instance. Um, um, so I'm not going to do that, not super technical. Um, so I'm going to be talking about something a little different. Um, how I can um, help the community in general is by looking at problems that I think we all have, uh, things that I see that uh, we could all improve in just a little bit. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking a little bit is about is the difference between privacy and security. And I think that sounds like, oh, wow, I, I, know, all, I know everything there is to know about that. But I think, um, I think we all, in fact, myself included, uh, tend to make mistakes when we talk about the differences between those two, and I wanted to sort of articulate that. So we all know this guy, Edward Snowden. Um, he made a lot of press uh, over the last year or so, but um, I want to I read you something uh, that I wrote just and uh, kind of get the, the general take on it. So Edward Snowden's revelations have made everything harder for law enforcement to, pre uh, to perform legitimate criminal investigations, now Tor, Bit. Coins, Janus VM, PGP. Full disk encryption is the bad guy starter kit as opposed to being known only by the, the most elite in the industry. So therefore, security has been degraded. Right? So I think if I say that in front of a crowd of people, it actually sounds like I'm making a, a pretty accurate statement. I'm, there's nothing really like uh, opinionated about that. There's nothing like really contentious even about those statements. That, that seems mostly factual. So let's try this statement. Uh, but said another way, governments can no longer spy on innocent people who have now uh, who now, now now know to take their privacy uh, more security, uh, more seriously using things like Tor, Bitcoins, Jazz VM, PGP, full disk encryption. Thanks to Edward Snowden, privacy has increased. So looking at those two statements side by side, both of them are probably perfectly factually correct um, independently. Put together, they're actually more accurate um, without the sort of uh, the spin that you get if you only hear one of the two, right? Does that make sense? Um, so that, I think, sort of levels the playing field. Now, there is a difference between those things, and I think depending on who you are and what you're saying, uh, they can actually have very dramatic changes in the, how people perceive what's going on. So um, what is security? Um, I found myself asking this stupid question. Like, I've been in this industry forever. Like, I don't actually know the definition. I should probably go look it up, right? So, um, so here is uh, dictionary.com's uh, definition. Uh, so freedom from danger, risk, safety. I think we can all agree with that definition. That, that fits uh, what we talk about. Freedom from care, anxiety, or doubt, well-founded confidence. Not, that's not us, right? We're not doing that. Uh, something that secures or makes safe protection, defense. Definitely. That's definitely something we work on, defense. We talk about it all the time. Uh, freedom from financial cares. Now, this is actually probably one of the most interesting ones that I think a lot of people fail to recognize as being probably one of the most important aspects of security. Uh, freedom from financial cares or want. The insurance policy gave the family security. Uh, this is actually probably the most important line item on this entire deck. Uh, you, it's really important that you know that monetary, uh, maybe not in the uh, currency sense, but some sort of protection of assets is very important to security. Uh, and then precautions taken to guard against crime, attack, espionage, sure, that also fits the definition that we typically talk about. What about privacy? So the state of being private, retirement or seclusion, sure. Um, you know, we, we want to have our privacy taken care of. The state of being free from intrusion or disturbance in one's private life or affairs. Phrased another way, the security of one's secrets, right? Um, so security and privacy do dovetail really nicely in that particular set of definitions. Secrecy, 
uh, a private place. No, not that one, right? So there are some interesting tidbits, just even the definitions. When we, when we really like break it down and articulate what the differences are, uh, there are very interesting uh, little gotchas, in, even in the definition. So this is a sort of a technical uh, example of where I think this, uh, this problem comes up. Um, I, I like to pick on STS. It's my favorite like, kind of non-technology thing to pick on. It's still a technology. Uh, but for those who aren't aware of it, strict transport security basically makes it so that you always go to HTTPS. Once you go there, you go there again, right? Um, so said that way, it sounds like I'm saying it's good for security, right? Does that make sense? So if I say STS does this, you're like, oh, that sounds like something I want. I don't want to be downgraded by uh, SSL strip or Middler. That sounds good, right? Um, but said a different way, it can actually be used as a tracking pixel, uh, you know, one bit of entropy for every STS domain that I set. Uh, there's ways around that. You can clear your cache and whatever, um, and browsers have implemented that. But So it's bad for privacy a little bit, right? Um, it's also not great because in some certain circumstances, uh, if you set STS, a domain meant to send you to HTTP, they can redirect you up to HTTPS, and then subsequently refers, uh, which contain private information and also nonces, can be sent to a domain that you didn't intend it to. Uh, so that's bad for privacy and security. Um, so now, when I, when I say it that way, <laughs> it's a little harder to, to talk about uh, what is it? Is it good for privacy? Is it bad for privacy? Is it good for security? Is it bad for security? Because uh, those things aren't necessarily, uh, they don't even go hand in hand, even in a single technical ex example. Uh, not that you can say that one is bad or one is good, it's just that they aren't exactly the same. You can't say the net effect is good or the net effect is bad without doing this sort of analysis. Yes, Jim? Two different ways. One, uh, it can be used as one bit of entropy for every subdomain you set it on. So I can have you know, 30 iframes on a page, uh, set it or don't set it. That's, each one of those things is a bit of entropy. You need about 30 subdomains to get a tracking pixel for every single man, woman, and child on the internet. That's one way. The other way is uh, when you have two domains, one is HTTPS, one is HTTP, no referring URL set, you redirect up to HTTPS, set STS, and subsequent, what, Jim? Yes. No. All right. Jim's with us. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what this really is kind of moving interestingly towards is that we're turning out that STS uh, is, is kind of a, a technical example. But uh, in general, we're sort of seeing things like this, exist.com, uh, which are technologies that basically monetize your privacy. They figure out ways uh, to track things that you're doing and give you some a small feature set that may or may not be attractive to you personally, uh, but what they're really doing is uh, changing your privacy into a commodity. Uh, and there's lots of examples of it. There's technology, for instance, that's on your mobile phone that as you go in and, in and out of certain geographic regions, it'll target things to you. And they say it's totally anonymous. But the thing is, and it probably is in that context, aside from the fact there's cameras in your credit card and your RFIDs in your sneakers. Uh, but uh, barring all that other sort of correlation stuff, uh, you can actually uh, track to two, two different locations. So they have to have gone through one location and then a subsequent location before you target them. Uh, if you do it to a very small geographic location, like someone's house, you can actually target this exact person. So uh, technologies like that, um, I'm not saying they're bad, but they do have privacy implications, and they basically are monetizing people's privacy. So this um, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure you've seen some variant of this. There's uh, lots of different examples of this. Um, um, but I think there's several interesting things about this that, um, that we don't really talk about as an industry particularly much. Um, so the first thing I immediately see is that privacy really isn't anywhere on here. Um, yet there's many examples of people killing themselves when their privacy uh, is stolen. And, and so what's really going on is if you look at any particular example, like sexual intimacy is a, a very common example where uh, someone doesn't want someone to know that they cheated on them or that they're a you know, drag queen in their spare time or whatever, right? Whatever it is. Um, those kinds of things uh, can drive people to do you know, sort of crazy things and kill themselves if, if their privacy is outed. Um, please don't kill yourself, by the way. Uh, come talk to me first. <laughs> but it turns out privacy is, um, and security both are actually directly integrated into many of these things. Uh, so safety actually has its own line item. It's, it's sort of like built here, the you know, security of your, of your uh, body or employment. Employment should be rephrased. It should not say employment. It should say money. 
uh, or currency or whatever it is that you rely on. Because you could have daddy's money, and if you run out of daddy's money, uh, you might kill yourself or you might be more susceptible to die of exposure because you, know, you can't pay for a house, right? Um, uh, so it's not really employment, it's uh, the stuff you need to survive, and that can be all kinds of things, commodities, food stamps, whatever, right? Some sort of uh, currency. Um, so um, let's say there's an example um, where uh, you um, are, we had a really wild night out in Vegas or something, right? Uh, and you come back uh, to work and you're like, man, I, did, I don't know what I did. I just completely blew it. I, I lost everything I had, right? Um, and you do some searches on Google. You're like, okay, how long do I need, uh, how long do I, do I have before I have to eat again, right? You know, uh, because like I don't want to spend any money until I get paid, right? That's kind of what you're thinking. Well, your boss can monitor that traffic and say, hey, this guy's in financial peril. Um, I probably shouldn't, you know, trust this guy with the keys to the kingdom, right? Or that kind of thing. So that kind of makes sense, right? What if you do the exact same thing out of your house, though? You do it out of your house, and you're thinking, I'm not doing this at work. I'm, I'm searching for, uh, you know, how to, you know, consolidate debts or, you know, make money quick uh, online or, you know, all kinds of crazy things or whatever. But I'm doing it in the privacy of my home on a completely separate computer, not work-related. Does my boss have a right to have that information? Probably not, right? I think we could all sort of agree that that's sort of not really his business, what goes on in the privacy of your house, despite the fact that there is financial implications for him. Uh, but then you go to the office and you log into the same Gmail account and your search queries are logged uh, because you turned that option on. And now does your boss have a right to that information? That's right. Um, so there, there becomes this weird thing where you can actually have these sort of downstream effects where you get fired and then you have increased exposure to the elements and you're more likely to die, all based off of some little stupid widget on a page. I mean, obviously there's a long steps to get there, but you get what I'm saying. Um, so, oh, one more quick point about this. Um, so their Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, is related to people, but you could create a very similar diagram that's related to companies. Companies have a very similar set of things, but they're, the things that they need are more like intellectual property and, uh, and money. If they don't get a certain influx of money, people get laid off and then you have no more company, right? Um, so there's, there's a very similar but different, uh, different sort of layout for companies. The one common thing, of course, is money. So, just so we're level set, I wanted to do a couple exercises. So um, you have to sort of ask yourself, um, what, which of these things are, which are they related to? Are they more related to security or are they more related to privacy? So why would you close the bathroom stall, right? Well, maybe you don't want to go to jail, but probably if you're in your own house and you close the door and there's nobody home, what are you doing that? You have this weird intimacy thing. You're, you're trying to make sure that you're, you feel private. You feel more private when the door is closed, despite the fact there's no one home, right? Uh, don't, don't do it if there's people around, by the way. Don't leave it open. Uh, why would you close the curtains in your hotel room? I did it this morning, right? Um, I did it even after I was leaving. I mean, I'm not, it's not like I'm worried about getting arrested. I was clothed, uh, but I still closed it. Why do I do that? Uh, for privacy, right? I don't do that for security. Um, I don't want people to see my stuff in there. Um, I don't want them knowing anything about me, right? Um, there, but there might be some security implications, right? Maybe someone could steal something out of it if they knew I was there or not there or whatever. Uh, patch your Flash or Java install. This is probably, most people would agree, is a security thing, right? But there is some tangential privacy stuff. Maybe they could steal stuff at, like, at an order like down the road. Like Once you get compromised, then they could do something anti-privacy. But not the indirect. It's more indirect as opposed to direct. Uh, keep medical details from your boss. Why would you do that? Well, it turns out you'd actually probably do it for both. Uh, you probably uh, are worried about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If he fires you because you, he thinks you have cancer, uh, that if directly impacts your ability to survive. Um, you know, I mean, literally, you're going to more likely die of cancer because you don't have health insurance anymore. Uh, but it really is a privacy thing. Um, it turns out that kind of information is privacy, but it directly impacts your security as well. Um, so all of these, if, if you go down, um, even things like hiding your employer. Um, hiding your employer is an interesting one. I'll get back to that one in a minute. But why would you ever want to hide who you work for? It sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, we all know each other. That's a, one of the very first questions you ask. Uh, there are reasons for it, though. I'll get back, back to it in a bit. So a lot of people think that privacy doesn't matter. Uh, like, oh, I don't have anything to hide or whatever. Um, well, it's not necessarily about you. It's about everybody, right? We're all we're sort of in this game together. And you might have loved ones uh, who you really don't want to see anything bad happen to. Regardless of whether you understand it or not, they might have secrets. Uh, Amanda Todd, for instance, uh, she killed herself when, uh, when she basically had some, some provocative pictures go out on the internet and people started you know, treating her bad and so on. She felt terrible about it and she killed herself. Um, 
cyber-stalked. Uh, this is a, a woman, uh, I forget where it was, uh, Peru or something, or Italy, rather. Uh, Italy, where uh, she ended up uh, getting killed by her husband, uh, who uh, found out that she had a fake account, uh, decloaked her, basically, uh, found where she was really living, and then killed her. Uh, so a privacy-related thing, again, related to a death. Uh, political dissidents, and I'm um, sorry it's uh, so small, but uh, it's not really important. I'm not, but I'm not just talking about Chinese dissidents, um, which I think are the most common thing we talk about, but there's also like uh, religious dissidents. Um, you know, the whole World War II, um, you know, people who have you know, different ways of thinking about things from the master race, uh, it turns out that they have something to hide when someone's coming to their door with a gun, right? Um, so there's all kinds of things, um, like Bosnians, the Russians, and Chechnya. Um, there's all kinds of ethnic cleansing going on. Um, so it depends on just on what side of the battle line you're on. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, drug users in Colorado prior to 2014. Uh, 2014 was an interesting year because now it's suddenly legal. So uh, before this date when it became legal, um, this is a crime you go to jail for. Now it's not, right? So now it doesn't really matter whether you're private or not. But before, it really does. It's the difference between you going to jail and not going to jail, right? Um, so that tiny bit of privacy uh, can actually dramatically increase your security, right? Um, uh, the other interesting thing about that is it's interesting to look at how the government has not really apologized to all the people who put in jail now that they realize they're wrong. They realize they're wrong, they've changed their laws, but they haven't gone back and actually made whole the people who they have done these terrible things to and put in our incarceration, right? Um, uh, the government doesn't apologize, by the way. <laughs> uh, and then you have sexual deviants like Alan Turing, um, kind of the godfather of cryptography um, and, and fuck, modern computing. We wouldn't even be here if it weren't for this guy, probably. Um, he killed himself because he was gay. Um, he, f you know, someone found out he was gay, um, and uh, they later um, basically got rid of him, uh, arrested at some point, and eventually killed himself. Uh, he has since been pardoned uh, for his crime of being gay, uh, just, I think, last year. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a easy table sort of way to look at the problem. Um, and this is, this is uh, just a hybrid, just random stuff I threw out. It wasn't, I didn't intentionally pick anything super contentious or whatever, just some examples. And um, my wife looked at this, she's like, this doesn't prove that there's, everything has one yes and everything has no, I realize that. But this is a good uh, exercise to sort of look at it. So updating your machine for, se for a security update. Um, this is, uh, is, this be is this good for your privacy? Probably not. Indirectly, maybe, but not directly. Uh, corporate privacy, the corporations don't get any extra privacy out of you updating your machine, right? Uh, consumer security, absolutely. Absolutely, this is really important for your security. You've got to update your machine, right? Uh, corporate security, uh, maybe. Depends on what we're talking about. Depends on the, what type of patches we're talking about. But if you, t again, take the word security and you stop talking about computers and you talk about what they're really interested in, which is the finances of the company, absolutely. Because if your software product is uh, losing you money and people don't trust your product anymore, uh, that is effectively uh, you know, a shot across the bow, right? So absolutely that affects corporate security. Uh, in this weird roundabout world of where uh, security of money is the same as security of technology or your person. Uh, so what about being anonymous to protect yourself from predators? So is that good for your privacy? Absolutely. Uh, is it good for cor corporate privacy? No, they're not gonna get anything out of you being private, right? Uh, but consumer security, absolutely, right? I just gave you a whole bunch of examples where people did, you know, were nice people, potentially very useful people to our society. Uh, they ended up killing themselves over uh, not being anonymous or not having that, that level of anonymity or privacy or whatever. Um, corporate security, no, they don't, get any, they don't get any money from this. There's nothing to be protected there. Um, what about logging out when you're done? Again, yeah, it's very similar. Uh, it's going to have almost the exact same thing across the board. But this actually could be good for consumer, uh, for customer, uh, sorry, corporate security. Uh, you know, no cross request forgery. You can't break into the site. Uh, you'll be able to maintain access to this, uh, your own account. I don't have to uh, spin up my CSRs and waste money, right? Again, protection of my money. Um, updating user machine to get new features, which increase uh, revenues for the company. That's, there's no value from, uh, from a privacy perspective for the consumer, none. Uh, corporate privacy, 
No, they're not going to get any private stuff out of that. They're not going to you know, maintain intellectual property or whatever. Uh, consumer security, no, they, they're not going to gain any security. Probably the security is going to go down if they added extra features of anything, right? Uh, but corporate security, yes. Um, they're going to be able to retain more revenues, build more revenues based off of that feature. Uh, in fact, if that feature breaks for some, for some reason or gets compromised, uh, they, they will be calling you and saying, go fix it immediately. It's, it's, a, it's endangering the company. Uh, DRM backdoors. This is one of my favorites. Uh, Sony was uh, implicated in this, for instance. Um, consumer privacy, absolutely not. There's nothing good about this for consumers at all, really. Uh, corporate privacy, absolutely. Uh, they're able to maintain their intellectual property, which is the music, the CDs. Um, they're able to maintain that, uh, continue to make revenues off of it. Bad for consumer security in all kinds of ways. Backdoors allow bad guys to log into your machine remotely. Uh, there's nothing good about that. Uh, and corporate security, yes, because, again, they maintain the revenues associated with it. Uh, and lastly, maintaining user state even after logout. Uh, terrible from a privacy perspective for you, great for them. Uh, privacy because they're able to uh, detect previously suspended users or people who might be uh, trying to do something uh, multiple times, uh, pulling data off your site uh, erroneously or whatever. Consumer security, uh, probably not. Uh, there's probably nothing for user to gain. There might be a little incremental gain, uh, but probably not. Uh, and corporate security, absolutely. Uh, they can maintain revenues. So let's take a different example, Tor Browser. This is, this is actually, um, if you want to delve into one uh, type of technology, I think Tor Browser is actually one of the more interesting ones. Uh, so I think people um, want to think that this is good for privacy and security. They want to because they're looking for a solution to these problems, and I think we all agree that the, you know, the faster we can get to that, so that solution, the better. Um, so um, why would it be good for anonymity, or why would it good be good for privacy? Let's, let's take an example. So let's say I want to submit a loan application. Uh, from an anonymity perspective, I can't be anonymous because I have to tell you who you're going to give the money to, right? You, I, have, I have to tell you, my name's Robert Hansen and I, and I want a loan, right? Uh, so there's, uh, anonymity doesn't even make sense in that context. Privacy, yeah, I may not want my boss to know that I'm doing it, right? I don't want my boss to know that I'm uh, maybe not doing so well or that I need a bridge loan or whatever, right? Um, so there's, really, there's no really, there's no good way to like anonymize yourself as you're going through Tor because you have to tell the other side what you're doing unless you're using HTTPS. If you're using HTTPS, that's a different story. But over HTTP, not so much. What about if you want to surf legal adult material as opposed to illegal? Um, anonymity, you probably don't need to be anonymous, uh, probably, unless you're like a, you know, in the church or a political person or something and you, you know, you're going to go, going to lose money or whatever, lose your right in the polls or whatever. Uh, privacy, yes. You don't want your boss to know you're surfing porn at work, right? <laughs> Not that you ever do that, right? right. Um, so what about being a political dissident? Absolutely. Absolutely. You do not want anyone to know. You don't want your friends to know uh, because you're putting them in jeopardy and yourself in jeopardy. Um, you want, uh, you're, you're never going to say your name as you're you know, submitting all these documents to you know, a foreign nation or whatever, um, or the press or whatever. You're not going to give them your name unless you're stupid. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that's a perfect example where Tor is a, a perfect fit. That's a great example. There's no problems there at all. It works perfectly. Uh, what if I want to research pressure cookers? So I'm, I'm Robert Hansen, and I'm researching pressure cookers. Uh, no, I'm not going to create any bombs, um, despite what you might think. Uh, <laughs> but I do want a crock pot. Um, and so that's an example where anonymity, um, I actually do want anonymity. I don't want anyone to know who I am when I'm doing that, that search, uh, because they're just going to ask too many questions when I'm just looking for a crock pot, right? Uh, or whatever, right? It's not a crock pot. I don't, know, I don't even know the difference. I'm not allowed to research it. Um, for, from a privacy perspective, uh, I probably don't care. If my wife finds out that I'm searching for crock pots, uh, she probably will just think I'm making a tasty meal, right? Uh, which is probably more likely. Uh, and then lastly, downloading an executable over HTTP. Uh, this is probably never a good idea because uh, it'll break your privacy and security when they give you malware uh, because it turns out the exit nodes can do bad things to you. Uh, and I'm not saying this out of school. I mean, uh, Tor says the same thing. When it's something's over you know, plain text, uh, a bad guy can do something bad to you. The exit nodes are all basically maintained by people who uh, are already sort of security savvy people uh, who may or may, or may not have your best interests at heart. Um, by the way, no judgment calls there. It's just these are some facts that I think most people don't understand. So this slide doesn't really make sense without the bubbles. But um, so there's there's multiple different parties involved in say a single sort of uh, uh, 
uh, type of business online. So this is an example of Google, for instance. Uh, so Google, uh, in this bubble here, uh, which you cannot see because it's way too, too, way too light, but um, uh, their interests are in higher ad spend. They basically want to make more money uh, from ads. That's the one thing that they've got unique to them. Um, and they want more data because that helps them in all kinds of different ways downstream. Whereas advertisers typically want high conversions, low cost per click, uh, they want higher click-through ratios, good return on investment. Um, they basically want to make more for their dollar. Uh, every, every dollar they spend, they want to get 10 back. Um, and the thing that they've got in common, because you can't see these bubbles here, uh, is monetizing users. That's the one thing that they all agree, or that those groups agree on. They both are trying to monetize users. Users, on the other hand, their, their interests are primarily privacy, security, and value. Uh, they want high value products. They don't want to get compromised when they're doing it. They want the best t-shirt for the best value, right? The thing that they have in common with advertisers is quality products. They want a good t-shirt because if the, t if the advertiser gives you bad t-shirts, you're not going to shop there again. Um, the thing that users uh, have in common with Google is search quality, which makes sense. Uh, you want to, when you search t-shirts, you don't want to go to a malware site. You want to get a good t-shirt site, uh, the best value t-shirt site. And the only thing that they all have in common all at the same time is faster performance. They all want the browser to go faster. Um, it's good for Google because they get more ads in front of you. It's good for the advertiser because you're more likely to click through because you're not wasting a lot of time on you know, a bunch of stuff superfluously loading. Uh, and it's good for users because they get to surf more of the internet quicker. Uh, but where this is, I think the most interesting part is actually why Google and the advertisers are not in alignment. Um, particularly in the, uh, in the privacy space. So Google, because they want more data, uh, you'd think that that's the same, that's the same they're in alignment with the, with the advertiser. The advertiser wants a lot of data too, but they, basically the advertiser has no incentive to want Google to have that data. Uh, Google, uh, when they have all that data, they can create alternative business models, um, and they've done this numer numerous times in the past, uh, and basically hurt the advertiser by creating competitive businesses because they know a ton about that, right? Uh, theoretically, anyway. I'm not saying they actually do that, but that's possible. So there's, there's, no, uh, there's no alignment of that particular one. Um, and in Google's perspective, uh, this, is, this is worth a lot of money. Uh, and what I don't mean like you know, pocket change money. I mean many, many, many tens of billions of dollars a year just in advertising business alone. Um, so when you're talking about incentives, this is very important to understand uh, the rationale be behind why someone would want to do that. So this uh, is a document that was written by effectively some analysis uh, uh, identified it as the actual author being the IAB, Interactive Advertising Bureau. But it was a letter written by Congress uh, to Mozilla to basically say that we sh uh, shouldn't allow third-party cookie blocking because somehow that blocks banner ads, uh, which it doesn't, but let's say. Uh, and because it blocks banner ads, it's more likely for um, things like Amber Alert to not show up uh, because there is some scenarios where they can put Amber Alerts on ads uh, not that you would even identify that that's what it is because no one even looks at ads, but, uh, but, if, but they believe this is somehow dot, dot, dot hurting the children, right? Um, so you have to look at what, how, wh why was this letter written? It's, it's not that it was written um, or the major technical fallacies in its authorship, uh, but it's why it was written. It's very interesting. There's very interesting alignment issues. And why it was written uh, is because the IEB pays Congress. Um, and, you know, not that much. We're talking about hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, not a tremendous amount of money. Uh, but they do, there's a direct incentive there for them to, uh, to write these types of letters and get uh, things um, changed in the browser or, not, or stymied in the browser that would allow their business model to do better. In this case, ads. That's what we're talking about. Uh, and by the way, Google sits on the IAB board of directors. So uh, in this case, uh, it's pretty simple. I think we were able to identify what the true modems were pretty quickly. Um, and I think, I think we can all agree, uh, ads were the reason that letter was written. Um, in this case of search engines I talked about, they're, it's basically higher ad spend, right? Um, it makes pretty, it's pretty easy to figure out uh, that kind of stuff. But remember I was saying um, that whole thing about understanding, uh, trying to hide who you work for? Uh, this is actually a really interesting, uh, big problem in our industry. So a couple weeks back, I got in an online conversation, which uh, ironically uh, started with a lot of ads. You probably aren't going to see this conversation. Uh, but <laughs> but um, it was this guy who was commenting on a, a post that I made, and you're going to ask, why can't I go look this? Uh, uh, why can't I go look? At, why are you telling me a conversation on Twitter? I'll just go look it up myself. I'll tell you why you can't do that. 
Um, this guy was basically commenting on something I was saying about the ad industry, and basically I thought you should use Adblock Plus or something equivalent, not Adblock Plus, but something like that. Um, and he said, you know, uh, you know, he was kind of changing the conversation about uh, protecting advertising revenue and companies need to stay in business and this big long diatribe and just really kind of going back and forth. And I'm like, I just didn't understand, like, why is this guy coming after me so hard? Um, and, and not just like one or two tweets. We're talking 10, 15 tweets back and forth. Um, so I went to try to figure out who this guy was. There must be some incentive. What, what is the purpose of this? Um, and he did a very good job of hiding who he was um, until I found uh, his resume. Uh, and uh, his resume told me he worked for the, the company that I was talking about. Um, and so his incentives were directly aligned um, with um, moving away from ad blocking uh, the browser uh, in the browser. So um, immediately I said, "Well, I would expect you to not understand what I'm talking about, given the fact that you work for the company I'm, I'm talking about." And I, I, I'm actually not interested in outing this guy. It's not the point of this. It kind of defeats the whole purpose of this deck, actually. Uh, but <laughs> but the important part was, as soon as I said that, the second I said that, he immediately said, "This conversation is over," and started deleting his tweets. He went backwards, retroactively started deleting all his tweets, uh, which is why you can't go look up this conversation, I, although I did keep a log. Um, so um, the irony here, the irony of this whole thing is the exact thing that, he, that I was talking about, the privacy aspects of it, uh, were the thing that was going to hurt him the most. So the exact technologies that are able to decloak people on the internet are the exact technologies that can get him fired for talking about this stuff on his company's behalf without being authorized to do so. Uh, the privacy that he wanted by deleting all of those tweets, he wanted to reclaim his privacy, is ironically the thing he's trying to take from all of you. See what I'm saying? Um, so that, that's a very interesting anecdote, and I have a whole bunch of very similar, but I think that one's, uh, since it's so recent, just a couple weeks ago, the irony is the privacy that you take from people might be the exact thing that they come after you for down the road. If you're hurting somebody down the road, and I'm, uh, I hate to put up Hitler's stuff, uh, uh, Third Reich or whatever, but I think you know, if, you, if you, uh, you know, extrapolate it from the Third Reich, not that I'm calling uh, EMC, RSA, the Third Reich or anything, please don't quote me on that, <laughs> um, the allegations of them um, downgrading security uh, for all of us uh, are that people are now coming after them. They're actually going after them. So uh, by virtue of their privacy being broken by Snowden, uh, they are now um, uh, going to be hurt by that fact. Do you see what I'm saying? So um, it's important to look at motives and understanding what the ramifications of that are. So I think most of the time you can figure out what people's motives are just by looking at who they're paid by. Not all the time. Uh, sometimes people are just ethical people and they have good motives. Sometimes not, though. Um, so it really comes down to what an expectation of privacy is. So there's companies like NIP, which you've probably never even heard of. Uh, I hadn't heard about it until I started doing this research, um, that sell um, something called the Twitter Firehose. Uh, so we have some people who work for Twitter here. You might be aware of this. Um, the Twitter Firehose is basically every single tweet that's ever been made in real time. They're just firing it off. And so there's a bunch of companies like Mass Relevance, uh, Apple, uh, People Browser, Salesforce, or whatever, they correlate all this stuff and use it for all kinds of tracking, advertising, sales, marketing, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, so ironically, this poor guy who thinks he just deleted all his tweets uh, now has to go to all of these locations to remove these tweets. So if really, if there was some expectation of privacy, it's long gone, right? It's long gone, and there's no way to get it back. There's no easy way to go back and ask all these people, pretty please, will you go delete my tweets, right? So this guy's job is permanently in jeopardy as a result of this, right? Um, so it really comes down to when are you really off work in this type of environment? When do you get to say my job doesn't dictate who I am, right? And I get to say whatever I want in my spare time. Well, it turns out uh, in today's day and age, it's very, very likely that it's never, um, which is very scary, and you, sh you guys should not be happy with that. Um, I think this is a, a pretty good example. Randy Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's sister, um, a couple, uh, it was a couple years back, um, she had some, some thing go out. Uh, there was a picture of her family um, and around Christmas, and somebody found it, um, friend of a friend kind of thing, found the picture and posted it up, and then Randy Zuckerberg is saying, like, that's totally uncool, that was supposed to be private, right? This is somebody who's, uh, <laughs> whose brother makes a living off of 
um, basically correlating, aggregating, and then marketing to all these people based on their private information, right? Um, so um, it's sort of hypocritical to fight for security and privacy sometimes, and then on the other hand, take it away, uh, because you can't really do that. You can't win both fights at the same time. You can't be private and then take it away from everybody else. It doesn't work that way. Um, it turns out we're all sort of interrelated. Uh, this is a beautiful quote uh, by Upton Sinclair. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding. Um, I think that is what we're coming towards. I think that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing uh, the motives being perverted um, by, by corporate money, by people's own salaries. Um, now, let me take a different stance on that. So I've told you one side of it. Let me tell you the other side. So uh, who could forget Silk Road? Uh, what a great year uh, for Silk Road. Uh, it was so fantastic. So many different things happened. Uh, if you didn't follow it all, it's pretty amazing. Uh, by the way, uh, Russ Ulrich um, actually uh, came from Austin, uh, which is, I thought was interesting. I didn't know him, but uh, pretty interesting. Um, so two things came out of that. One, it turns out that OPSEC is the most critical hole in Tor when Tor is used properly. When Tor is not used properly, there's all kinds of other problems, but when it's used properly, OPSEC is how Ross and all of his compatriots got nailed. Uh, they told too much information, uh, they gave too much information away, and then ultimately the second problem was it proves that the, the problem is the buyer. The buyer is the major hole in this um, because you have to have a physical address to send stuff to, right? Um, so uh, the government was able to correlate uh, somebody sending fake IDs to a location. They got Ross, and then they correlated all these other OPSEC problems he had to his original identity as the uh, owner of Silk Road, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts. Um, so there are other problems. Uh, the sellers do have problems as well. Um, in fact, there was a great article just a couple weeks back about uh, how the buyers, uh, sorry, how the sellers can be correlated at the post office when they're shipping stuff. If you come in shipping a couple pounds of cocaine to the post office, you know, you know, you might get nailed there too. Uh, there's other stuff here. Uh, this is a, it's a little little light, so I'll read it to you. Um, this is a uh, post that was done on the underground um, by a group called Cthulhu. Uh, it said, solutions to common problems. We're an organized criminal group, former soldiers, mercenaries from the e, uh, FFL, highly skilled with military experience of more than five years. We can perform hits all around the world. So basically, this is a, this is a um, four hire uh, hit squad uh, who will go and kill people. Uh, just submit Bitcoins to this address, uh, and they'll go off and kill people, right? And the most important part of this is why they believe they can operate is they say, in, I'm, just not, I'm not putting words in their mouth, they say, uh, because it's anonymous. This works because it's anonymous. Uh, anonymity allows this, this kind of thing to exist, allows Silk Road to exist, allows people to have four higher murderers online to exist, right? Um, that sounds pretty bad. So when I talk to black hats, um, this, the, um, specifically uh, the more high-end black hats, the guys who are making you know, between 10 and $100 million a year kind of uh, level, um, they're focused primarily on uh, changing people's buying decisions. They want to pe get people to buy something, right? Um, you know, Viagra or casinos or whatever, right? The, the bad thing that they're trying to get someone to do, right? Um, privacy is very critical to their business. If they don't have privacy, uh, it's going to be awfully hard for them to operate in regions where they'll go to jail for that type of activity, right? Uh, and there's some regions where the jail is actually the least bad thing that can happen to them. <laughs> so uh, privacy is a very big deal. So they have something to hide. They're the people. When people say, oh, I don't have something to hide, these are the people who have something to hide. Uh, they're definitely, this fits the category. I think we can all agree this person, these groups of people are the people we're after or whatever, right? Um, and then at one point, uh, just as a brief anecdote, uh, they told me they were seriously considering getting a guy elected to Senate so that they could enact more privacy laws, right? Uh, so when you see somebody up in Senate saying, I want more privacy, um, it may be an actor working on behalf of a criminal organization who wants more privacy, right? So we, I think we can all agree uh, this is a, bad group of people, right, or don't have our best interest at heart as the consumers. And then we have the governments, um, and not just our government, all governments. Uh, I think if people are way too focused on just the NSA. It's all governments, or at least all governments that care about cybersecurity. Um, DoubleClick, Yahoo, et cetera, cookies are being used and leveraged to correlate people down to a specific location. So whether you want to think about them an as an adversary or not, they definitely are an adversary, depending on which side of the border you're on, depending on what, what you're doing or whatever. Um, so, um, in this context, 
It sounds an awful lot like what I'm saying is um, we should actually uh, consider privacy a bad thing, right? We should, because these governments, maybe, maybe, maybe my government isn't so bad, but these black hats are really bad, right? We, maybe we should find a way to find these guys, uh, strip away even more privacy and security so that we can get them, right? So this leaves us with some pretty ugly options. Um, I, I don't want to paint a pretty picture here because it's not. It's, uh, it's pretty awful. So you have to kind of decide which side you're going to be on. And, and here are your decisions. Uh, so you should probably start looking now and pay attention because this, uh, you're going to have to make these decisions eventually. You might as well do it today. <laughs> Consumer privacy versus corporate security. If you had to pick one of the two, which side would you land on? Um, depends on who you're paid by, depends on your ethics, uh, but you're going to have to pick one, so you better pick the battle lines, right? Uh, direct consumer privacy versus indirect consumer safety. So this would be like the TSA, for instance. Are they allowed to do the hand groupy stuff at the, at the, at the gate? Uh, in the off chance that I might get blown up in a building um, you know, sometime down the road when a terrorist hijacks an airplane or whatever, right? So indirect uh, safety. Uh, which would you prefer having, right? Um, you might choose one or the other. You might be flip-flopping on some of these. It's okay, uh, but you should, you should know where you land. Um, corporate livelihood or consumer privacy. In some cases, not all cases, there are some cases where those things are in alignment, but in a lot of cases, they're not in alignment. So corporate livelihood, would you prefer a company exist or would you prefer that you have privacy? Right? Um, would you prefer that all of your inf information, that all the stuff you hold secret, and all the people that you know, and all the secrets that they have, would you prefer that those things are now public, or would you prefer that that company has, has a, is ex in existence, is allowed to exist? Right? You have to choose one of those. That might come down to that kind of decision. Um, so to, to get more personal, is it your own job or your own freedoms? Do you want to be the guy employed at the company stealing people's privacy? Um, or do you want to have your, privacy, your own privacy and your freedoms, right? So I never said these decisions were simple, <laughs> um, but I think that it's important that you guys decide for yourself where you land in a minute, Jim. Um, so in summary, um, you've got to decide for yourself. Um, I'm not going to make these decisions for you. I'm not even trying to give you ethical uh, guidance here. I'm just saying that there is a decision, and if you haven't made one, you absolutely need to make one. Um, is it going to be in this example, not in all cases, but in, in this example, is it the consumer or the advertiser? That's what I was talking about earlier. Um, ultimately, we need to be wary of people's motives. Um, we need to identify what their real motive, what, what's actually driving them to make these statements. Are they being paid? Um, is it just a, a good ethical agreement? Or do they really have a reason they believe this? You, know, you sort of have to delve into it, which unfortunately, this is, this is a very scary one. Uh, because we kind of need to dig in a little bit. We need to actually find information about these people. We need to decloak people before we can even understand what their real motives are. We have to strip away their privacy just to even have a conversation where we know what their motives are. So this is not an easy one. Um, but ultimately, we need to be wary of any time we see them not in alignment with the consumer. If they're not in alignment with the consumer, there's probably a profit motive there. Probably. Not always, but probably. But you know, I was talking with Jeremiah about this, and, and he said, basically, we need to create a new lexicon. You know, we have all these words that are super technical, you know, DNS rebinding and cross-site scripting and whatever that are very DOM-based cross-site scripting, very specific, very articulate, describing these things. But we don't have a good set of lexicons for privacy and security, ironically, given the business we're in. Uh, when we go to the press and we're saying, this is good for privacy, at best, we're being inaccurate. At worst, we're being disingenuous. Um, we need to come up with better words. We need to be more articulate for other people, not for ourselves. We probably know exactly what's going on, probably, you know, barring any uh, issues with our own understanding of technology. Uh, we probably understand all the ramifications of both sides, but as an industry, we're not very good about articulating those things. Uh, in press articles, you'll often see, this is bad for privacy, but, it, but is it good for security? You know? And so you, you sort of have to say, here are the pros and cons of what we're doing and let people make educated decisions. Right now, we just don't do that. Uh, or at least not very often. And then ultimately, uh, you have to weigh what you're giving up to give up that privacy. I mean, what, what are you giving up? Uh, you're giving up your privacy, you're giving up your security. What are you giving up? Um, and what are you gaining for that? Are you gaining uh, a cool widget? Are you gaining uh, the ability to buy t-shirts better? Uh, what are you gaining for those loss of privacies and freedoms? I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying you need to make that decision. Um, ultimately, in this example, the, the statement, you are the product 
uh, is something you have to internalize. Do you want to be the product? Is that okay? Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, depending on what we're talking about. Uh, or you may never be okay with it. But those are the decisions we have to make. Uh, and I think if we're a little bit more articulate about what these things are, we can make a uh, much more informed decision, and we can allow consumers to make a more informed decision. Um, and that's it. That's all I had to say. <laughs>